Dear Dad, Greetings from the new deputy curator at Beecho Museum in Washington, D.C. I miss you, by the way. How's Africa? I sure hope this letter reaches you in Ouagadougou before you move on to Nairobi. So I got the internship. Your old friend Franklin Rose was awfully nice to submit my name to the rest of the members of the museum's board of directors. What an opportunity while I'm in between cases. As you probably know, the museum specializes in ancient Maya culture. My supervisor is going to be Joanna Riggs, a well-known archaeologist. Maybe you've seen her name in the news recently, in conjunction with the discovery of a strange Maya monolith. Apparently, it's created quite a buzz among experts in the field. Well, Beach Hill plans to feature the monolith in an upcoming exhibition. Just imagine, this artifact has been buried for hundreds of years, and now it's going to be unveiled to the public for the first time. The museum is short-staffed at the moment, and they're expecting such a huge turnout that they've closed their doors to prepare. I can hardly wait to dig into this exciting project and learn how archaeologists and historians solve the mysteries of ancient cultures. I'll keep you posted. Love, Nancy. Nancy Drew, I presume. I'm Joanna Riggs. Welcome to Beach Hill. I was just checking the lock on this display case. This is one of the museum's most treasured pieces, a carving of King Pakal. Who is King Pakal? Pakal assumed the throne at age 12. Can you imagine? That was 615 AD. He ruled for 68 years at the height of the Maya civilization. Is that jade? Yes, the Maya loved jade and used it for many of their carvings. There isn't another piece like this in the world, and it's priceless, which means I practically had to sell my own grandmother to get it. How did the museum acquire it? Leave it to Taylor Sinclair. He's a wizard when it comes to these deals. You'll meet him later. Now then, Nancy, you're coming on board at a critical time for Beach Hill. An exhibit of this caliber is not kid stuff. Franklin Rose assures me you're a real trooper, and I hope he's right because I'm not here to babysit. I don't care who your father is. I'm glad to be here. Please, tell me more about the exhibit. In addition to our permanent collection, we're borrowing rare pieces from museums and private collectors around the world. Soon we'll be sitting on the most fabulous collection of Maya artifacts ever assembled in one place. And now that we've scored the monolith, too, Beach Hill Sora numero uno. Was the monolith excavated in Mexico? Yes, a hot young team of archaeologists, Americans and Mexicans both, dug it out of a cave near Palenque. Every curator from here to Siberia was trying to get a hold of it, but I'm the one who closed the deal. What does this monolith look like? It's a massive pillar of stone, nearly 1,500 years old, with Maya glyphs carved into it. We've installed it in the garden. Wait until you see it. Could you explain what a glyph is? A glyph, as in hieroglyphic, is a picture that represents a word or an idea. Henrik is the human encyclopedia on the subject. How many glyphs are there in all? Henrik can help you with that. Henrik, is he on staff here at the museum? Henrik Vanderhoon, world-renowned expert in Maya hieroglyphics. He's the latest addition to the Beach Hill Brain Trust. I told him I don't even want to see his pointy Vander head till he's got a translation on that monolith. Do you think the glyphs hold an important message? I really don't know. The Maya were at their peak during Pakal's reign. After he died, things began to go downhill. The civilization never regained the oomph it had under its most extraordinary king. What was the key to Pakal's success? If the message on that monolith is from King Pakal himself, it might give us a clue. Credit for a discovery like that can only spell one thing, my dear. R-E-V-E-N-U-E. -E. Anyway, there's a list of tasks for you in the lab. Once you've knocked those off, we'll regroup. Shouldn't I have more training? Don't worry, you'll be in the swing of things soon enough. Go ahead and take a look around the museum. I'm sure you'll find the monolith, Mui and Terrasante. Or just roll up your sleeves and hit the lab. Any last advice before I get down to business? Semper ubi sabubi.
Topeka Commission for the Arts. How cultured. Topeka Commission for the Arts. That's the organization Prudence Rutherford works for. The knob is missing. You must be Nancy, the new deputy curator. I'm Henrik Vanderhune. Pleased to meet you. What are you working on? Just some light housekeeping. Why are you wearing that mask? Oh, these dusty old artifacts are murder on my allergies. <clears throat> anyway, what can I do for you? I'm curious about your work. How do you go about translating a glyph anyway? It can be a complicated process, involving research, piecing lots of different elements together, and a healthy dose of guesswork. So there isn't a definitive dictionary of Maya glyphs where you can look things up? Oh, I'm afraid not. You see, glyphs are so intricate and full of subtleties that multiple meanings may be embedded in a single glyph. So three distinct-looking glyphs may all translate to mean sunshine, roughly, but with different nuances. There is so much we still don't know. Lucky for me, I guess, or I'd be out of a job. Joanna turned me loose without too many instructions. Do you have any advice for me? Well, as you've probably heard, the museum is closed in preparation for the exhibit, so you'll have free run of the place. Please explore. The sooner you get to know your way around, the better. Think of the lab as your home base, your center of communications. Anyone who wants to get in touch with you will leave a note or a voicemail here, so check in often. I'm very busy with my work, so you're going to have to be pretty independent, but I suspect you wouldn't have it any other way. See you around, Henrik. I suspect you will. I shouldn't be messing around with this without permission.
It looks like some pieces are missing. Greetings. I'm not sure what to do with those shards of pottery Joanna left for me. Play around with those pieces until you've reconstructed the pot they once were. There may be a few extraneous pieces. Likewise, you may find yourself on a scavenger hunt for a piece or two, if I know Sunny June. Can I give that ham radio a try? Absolutely not. The radio is a tool, not a toy. One has to be extremely careful about the kind of information one sends out over the airwaves. And I do not have time to monitor you. And besides, the vacuum tubes have been terribly fussy lately. If another one blows, I think I'll go mental. What is the Spectro X Archeo Analyzer for? It's used for identifying chemical compounds that are found on artifacts, traces of ink, blood, charcoal, and other substances. The beauty of the machine is that it can collect these traces without damaging the artifact in any way. But it cost us a fortune, so don't fiddle with it unless you get Joanna's permission. See you around, Henrik. That will be fine. Silvio's Curatorial Bonanza. May I speak to Silvio Jr., please? This is Silvio Jr. What can I do for you? I'd like to place an order, please. Have you ordered from us before? Well, I haven't personally, but the museum has. Okay, good. That saves me a lot of paperwork. What's the account number? BH-119K. BH-119... BH-119K? Beach Hill? Are you serious? That's right. I'm the new deputy curator, Nancy Drew. Well, whoop-dee-doo, it's Nancy Drew. But Silvio's curatorial bonanza no longer does business with Beach Hill. I've sent all six of the outstanding invoices to a collection agency. And you jokers won't get another packing peanut out of Silvio Jr. ever. Do not call here again. Boswell, Jackson, and Rose. May I speak to Franklin Rose, please? Who may I say is calling? This is Nancy Drew. Just a minute, please. Nancy, great to hear from you. How's the internship treating you? Are Joanna and Henrik showing you the ropes? So far, so good, I think. There's a lot of work to do before we launch this exhibit, but somehow we'll pull it off. Glad to hear you're settling in. I'm off to a meeting, but feel free to call me if you have any questions. I'm sure everything's going to be smooth sailing, Mr. Rose. Bye, kiddo.
Ceramic bowls, such as the one featured in this exhibit, may have been used as vessels for burnt offerings of incense or corn. This bowl was either dedicated to or used to supplicate the god of war, Balak. Although the geographic range of Maya cities is well known, it is difficult to determine the range of Maya influence. Some experts believe the Maya may have traveled as far south as the Amazon and as far north as North America. It's locked. It's locked. The Maya used different methods to represent numbers. Here is an example of the numbers from 0 to 19, from top left to bottom right. Notice how some numbers are represented with bars and dots, and some are represented with pictures. The Maya were pantheistic, believing in many gods who ruled over different aspects of Maya life. Chak was the god of rain. Ishel, goddess of the moon, presided over childbirth and basket weaving. Ahau Kin represented the sun. The Maya were pantheistic, believing. It's locked. Lady Zach Cook ruled Palenque before her son ascended the throne in 615 CE. Maya tradition required that the kingship be handed down from father to son, but Lady Zach Cook broke this custom by establishing herself as a deity. This gave her the power to justify the new royal lineage. Because his mother had been deified, Pakal often referred to himself as the first true king. I am Lord Pakal, ruler of the mighty kingdom of Palenque. All those who come before me witness my power. Lord Pakal is considered the most influential ruler of the Maya civilization. Cultural, scientific, and military achievement flourished under his reign. As with all Maya kings, very little is known about his personal life since all written inscriptions dealt solely with public achievements such as wars, battles, coronations, births, marriages, and deaths. Maya scribes recorded the official history of the kings and queens but very little is known about daily life in the Maya world. Although there are thousands of inscriptions found on artifacts and architecture, there are only a handful of Maya books in existence today. Maya scribe. Strange supernatural creatures, sometimes called monsters, played an important role in Maya mythology. These monsters were often associated with the earth, caves, or mountains. The bicephalic monster, sometimes called the celestial or cosmic monster, may have represented the sunrise or a long journey. Just one more tile.
The date on this slab uses the Tzolkin, or divine calendar, made up of 20 weeks each with a named day and 13 weeks each with a numerical day. The two types of weeks progress independently of each other. The Maya ball game was a religious activity as well as a spectator sport. Players would propel a rubber ball through a small stone hoop using their thighs, hips, and forearms. It is believed that the players were often sacrificed after a game. Ritualized bloodletting was a common practice among the Maya. In this panel, three captives wear garments associated with bloodletting. A variety of instruments including stingray spines, thorns, and bone awls were employed for this activity. Archaeologists work in some of the most remote areas of the world. Ham radios are often the only means of contacting the outside world. Ham is an acronym for Handheld Amateur Radio. This side looks damaged. Nancy Drew, or should I say, Detective Drew, I'm Sinclair. Hi there. I guess you've done your homework. I was at a meeting with the BOD recently, and I caught wind of your appointment and your credentials. Very impressive, if I do say so myself. Well, I'm not on a case right now, that's for sure. I'm the new deputy curator, remember? So, how's this for a specimen? Ever seen a million dollars worth of rock before? Do diamonds count? Ouch. Well, they did say you were sharp. Seriously, though, thank goodness you're here. I'm afraid the museum may be in terrible jeopardy. What kind of jeopardy? Joanna told me to butt out, but I'm so fond of Beach Hill, I just hate to see it fall prey to scoundrels. What scoundrels? It's a sensitive subject. Meet me in my office later and I'll explain everything then. You've got me worried. Can't we talk now? Just meet me later. 707 Bing Cherry Boulevard. I've got to go. Enjoy your first day at Beach Hill. Interesting. It's locked. It's locked. The Maya kings were often in a protracted state of war with local kahals. Here, Bird Jaguar stands to the right as a captured lord kneels at his feet. The Cajal holds a broken umbrella, a gesture typical of a supplicating captive. The four miniature gods clinging to the Vision Serpent are the Headband Twins, Hun Ahau and Balam, and the Twins of Sacrificial Dance, Chak, Shibs, Chak, and the baby jaguar. The Maya were particularly fascinated with twins, and many of the Maya gods were paired together. In 
In addition to adorning themselves with jewelry and costumes, the Maya shaped their bodies to heighten their beauty. Beads were dangled in front of infants' faces to encourage crossed eyes, a trait considered attractive to the Maya. There, that looks like it's in order. There, now I can start putting this together. I see you succeeded in reconstructing that Maya pot. Do you know what the glyph on it means? Something like, don't play ball in the house? Place name glyphs are some of the rarest and most difficult to translate. Even most of my colleagues wouldn't have a clue about this one. Ah, uh, but I'm a rare breed myself, Nancy, and this is one of my areas of expertise. In the words of Nicholas Falcone, come on, spill it! The glyph on that pot signifies the great ancient Maya city of Copan in Honduras. There happens to be a very important dig going on there right now. Why is it so important? When you've been researching a civilization for over half your life, you get very excited about any new evidence that is found. I'm keeping up with the action by ham radio. Did you know the deputy curator who was here before me? Hurricane Sonny? I'm afraid I did. If he wasn't losing paperwork or setting off the fire alarm, he was cornering our visitors with his theory that the Maya were abducted by aliens. I'm afraid you'll be cleaning up his messes for a while. I'm supposed to order more packing supplies, but the company says they won't do business with us anymore. Does Beach Hill have bills it can't pay? Uh, no comment. But Henrik, what will we do when we run out of packing supplies? I hereby absolve you of that task. If Joanna wants things shipped, she can stuff them into garbage bags for all I care. See you around, Henrik. I suspect you will.
How may I help you? Hi, I'm Nancy Drew, the new deputy curator over at Beach Hill. So, you're Joanna Riggs' newest pirate in training. How does it feel to join the ranks with the modern-day conquistadors? I beg your pardon, but how does a deputy curator become a pirate in your book? You had better brush up on your history, young lady. When the Spanish explorers invaded Mexico, they became known as the conquistadors or conquerors. They robbed the indigenous peoples of their wealth, not just their gold, but their artwork, their sacred objects. Anything they did not steal, they burned to the ground. Alejandro, I understand that many crimes were committed in the name of exploration, but that was hundreds of years ago. What does this have to do with Beach Hill? There is more. In the 19th century, archaeologists discovered the ruins of ancient civilizations predating even the Aztecs. Many of the dig sites were robbed, and the stolen artifacts were sold off to art museums and collectors around the world. Today, finally, it is illegal among most civilized nations to remove an artifact from its native country. But sadly, there are thousands of precious antiquities with highly questionable provenance floating around the Western world. But Joanna only wants to display this artwork, to celebrate it, so the public will be able to enjoy it and learn about your people's great talents and achievements. If the American public wants to see our art, they should come to Mexico. What do you mean by questionable provenance? An artifact's provenance is the story of its origin and ownership. For example, how it made its way from a temple at Chichen Itza to a museum in Washington, D.C. If the artifact's provenance reveals that it has been stolen, then that artifact must be returned to the country of its origin. So the problem has been remedied, hasn't it? No, not at all. Provenance documents are often tampered with or forged to cover up the theft. Because of this, thefts continue and a great deal of art is moved on the black market, even today. Unethical art dealers and greedy museum curators do nothing to stop this. Are you suggesting Beach Hill is involved in these kinds of misdealings? If Joanna Riggs or that overstuffed pillowhead Sinclair had any decency, they would take measures to see that all Maya artifacts were returned to Mexico at once where they belong. Well, I think I'll have to chew on some of these issues for a while, Alejandro. In the meantime, I do need you to sign off on these changes to the loan agreement for the monolith. Do you mind? I am still not happy that such a rare find will have its debut exhibition on American soil. But in my country, too, there are people for whom money talks. I will take those documents now. Thank you. I have some business with Joanna at the museum later, so I will return the contract to her then, after I have looked it over. Actually, Alejandro, I think I'm supposed to take them back to Joanna myself. You may consider your mission accomplished. Well, uh, okay then. Goodbye.
Hey, Bess, it's me, Nancy. What's new? It's pouring rain. George and I are in the middle of a heated game of Go Fish, and I'm winning. Don't believe a word she says, Nancy. Last hand, I made mincemeat out of her. Anyway, we don't want to make you homesick. How's the internship going? So far, so good. There's a lot of excitement about the upcoming exhibit, especially since we have the Palenque monolith. The who? The monolith. It's a giant block of stone recently excavated from a cave near Palenque in Mexico. Apparently, it's a very big deal. They think it's 1,500 years old. So, have you seen it? This, uh, monolith? Yeah, it's humongous. Must weigh a ton. Like how big? As big as a refrigerator? <laughs> Maybe Bigfoot's refrigerator. Sorry, Nancy, but... How would a person tell this monolith apart from, say, some other big rock? Well, for one thing, it has Maya glyphs carved into it. Glyphs? Pictures that represent words or ideas, also known as logographs. Joanna says the glyphs might be a message from King Pakal. What kind of message? We don't know yet. Henrik Vanderhuhn, Beach Hills epigrapher, is working on a translation. Who was King Pakal? He's considered one of the great Maya rulers. He reigned at the height of the Maya civilization. Well, Nancy, you're sounding very curatorial. Very curatorial indeed. We've been worried that you would be a little bored without a mystery to solve, but it sounds like your brain will have plenty to chew on. The whole Maya culture is a mystery to me at the moment. The last thing I'm going to be is bored. I'm sure of that. Speaking of kings... This card game's not over yet, Bess. Yes, well, I hope you've got plenty of bait for your fishing pole, dear cousin. Okay, you two. I'll call back later. Call back soon. Yeah, and good luck. It's about time. Oh, my fears are like maggots infesting my poor old carcass. Want a cookie? They're from Oaxaca. No, thank you. You said Beach Hill is in jeopardy. I need to know why. The art world is being ransacked, Nancy. Prudence Rutherford, a major patron of the arts, had her fire ruby necklace stolen from her villa in Topeka. Two weeks later, a whole display case full of rare Maya artifacts was heisted from a museum in New Mexico. Do you think there's a connection between the two thefts? Who knows? I'm just telling you, this community, our friends and colleagues, my people are being systematically trounced by thugs! Who's to say Beach Hill won't be next? You've got to do something! Does Joanna share your concerns? I've urged Joanna to approach the board about making some security upgrades, but she just keeps saying that the timing isn't right to ask for money. I understand your concern, but what can I do to help? We need your eagle eyes. We need your bat ears. We need you to sniff out the stink of trouble. I appreciate the vote of confidence, but I'm just a detective, you know. I'm not bionic. Don't play modest mouse with me. Okay, no more flattery. Hey, that's an interesting piece. There, by your desk. Something tells me it's not a Maya artifact. How about that rubber shark? The artist's name is Poppy Dada. She's a teenager in South Dakota. The art world is going bananas over her stuff. I'll unload that one for some serious dinero. Is Poppy Dada her real name? I don't know. Joanna says you performed an act of wizardry in helping Beach Hill acquire the Pakal carving. Getting those provenance docks together was a pig and a half. 
Oh, they're on the up and up, I assure you. But ah, to have been at the height of my career back before the crackdown, those were the days. A pig and a half? Maybe sometime I'll tell you a sad story I call How Mexico Lost Its Sense of Humor. Not today, though, Nancy. Alejandro says you're unethical, a modern-day conquistador, that you're robbing Mexico of its cultural history. <laughs> and I say Alejandro is the real bully of the playground, a lunch money extortionist who loves nothing more than to see the other boys and girls go hungry. When you sell a piece of art, what kind of commission do you get? Standard, 10%. It's no king's ransom, unless, of course, you sell something for a million bucks. Too bad I'm not allowed to put that monolith on the market, huh? I'd better get going. Bye now. Good thing Franklin gave me the museum key. Looks right. Nancy, the police are on their way. I should talk to Joanna before I touch anything. Someone has cooked up my worst nightmare and served it to me on a plate. I'd like to have a look at the crime scene myself. Did the police turn up any clues? The police took some samples for the crime lab, but they couldn't promise any overnight results. So if you want to put your little magnifying glass up to the scene, it's fine with me. What were their initial findings? Who knows? Right now, my priority is to get a move on this insurance claim. Why did you become a museum curator? I became a curator because I want to help make artifacts available to as many people as possible. That's all that matters, isn't it? Unless you're Alejandro Del Rio. Do you think Alejandro would go to extreme measures, like stealing, to reclaim Mexico's artifacts? Who knows? When did Henrik come on board? I got an email from him one day saying he heard the news about Beach Hill getting the monolith. He said he'd drop everything to come here and translate those glyphs. He was even willing to take a pay cut. What could I say except giddy up? You're hired. Where was he working before? At the Chaco Canyon Cultural Center in New Mexico. I've got work to do. Bye.
Need something? Have you seen Henrik? I found a piece of paper inside the Pakal display case. It had some glyphs on it and a print of a red hand. I'm hoping he can give me a translation. What am I, fish food? Henrik's not the only one around here who can read a glyph, you know. Okay, great. Did you happen to see the thief's message? The police showed me the note. It said, the magician suffers yellow death, whatever that means. Apparently, the thief just couldn't come up with the glyphs for the curator suffers flaming purple disgrace. I'm curious about the red handprint the thief left. Does it have any significance in Maya culture? Afraid I can't help you there. What I want to know is what the hand was printed with. It's obviously not finger paint. Why don't you do a little analysis on it in the lab? I haven't seen Henrik since the theft. Where do you think he could be? Who knows? Wow, Henrik must have taken a real nosedive off that pyramid. Do you think he just fell, Nancy? Or was he pushed? Sounds like you need to find out about hospital visiting hours. Yeah, but you'd better get the lowdown from Joanna first. George is right. She is your supervisor, after all. Okay, I've got a graph of the chemical used for the handprint. Now I've got to match it up with a known substance. That's it! According to this chart, HG stands for mercury. S stands for sulfur. So the handprint was made from mercury and sulfur. First the Pakal carving is stolen, and now my star glyph man bumps his head and forgets his own name? What's next, Nancy? Del Rio pulls the plug on the monolith, the board clams up on my funding, my mother posts my old prom pictures on the internet? Take it easy, Joanna. I'm sure everything is going to be okay. What I need from you right now is action, not commentary, Nancy. Will you follow up with the hospital and see if there's anything we can do to get Henrik's marbles back? How can I help around here? You can also pick up Henrik's mail if he gets any. Keep the lab in order and just try to help me keep the entire museum from going up in smoke. I did the chemical analysis you suggested. That red hand was printed with a compound containing mercury and sulfur. 
Does that mean anything to you? Sure, sure, cinnabar. The Maya would rub it into their most important carvings to add definition to the artist's lines. Where would a person get a supply of cinnabar? We use cinnabar here at the museum the same way the Maya did, to keep things as authentic as possible. Henrik orders those kinds of supplies, but we've been out of stock for quite a while. The last I heard, there was some kind of holdup with the distributor. I've got work to do. Go to it. Voicemail. Press zero to retrieve messages. Press Nancy, hi. It's Franklin Rose. I'm calling because it's just... This theft is very bad news for the museum. You can't imagine the limb we went out on to acquire that Pakal carving. It's been one of the museum's main attractions. Um, I don't want to take you away from your internship, but if you can do a little investigating, well... I think I speak for the whole board when I say we'd be very grateful. Give me a call when you have a chance. And Nancy, thanks. This message is for Nancy Drew. Hi, Nancy. This is Nurse Bluefoot calling from Eleanor Roosevelt Memorial Hospital in regards to Henrik Vanderhoon. I believe you're a colleague of his. Since Mr. Vanderhoon was admitted, he has repeated your name several times in states of semi-consciousness. As we've been unable to contact any of his family members, we're hoping you might be willing to act as Henrik's support person as he begins the difficult process of restoring his memory. Please call me as soon as possible to discuss this. My direct line is 202-555-4000. Thank you. To replay messages, press sir. Keep it real. Max speaking. Hi, I'm the new deputy curator over at Beach Hill Museum. I wonder if you could answer a couple of questions for me about our ordering history. Well, hello there, Beach Hill. Hey, you're not Sonny June. Whatever happened to that guy? I suppose he caught a ride on a flying saucer, huh? <laughs> what a riot. Uh, I'm sorry. Anyway, you don't need to reorder, do you? Unless you ate last week's shipment for breakfast, that is. You're sure it was last week? Oh, that's what it says here. Do you know who placed that order? Well, the initials on the order are J.R. Was the package shipped to the museum? Uh, oh, oops, I guess we didn't ship it at all. It looks like the package was picked up here at the warehouse. So there hasn't been a holdup at the distributor or anything like that? Holdup? Oh, I don't know where you heard that. We've got enough mercuric sulfide in-house to sink a ship. Can you remember anything about the person who picked up the package? Hmm. Uh, I sure can't. Guess I must have been at lunch or something. Well, thanks for your help. Sure thing. I hope there wasn't any problem with the stuff, was there? We only used a top-grade mercuric sulfide. Judging by the impression it left, I'd have to agree that the quality was fine. Well, you sound a little green in the chemicals department, if you don't mind my saying so. I hope you know that mercuric sulfide is highly toxic. Makes you crazy. Well, I have heard that mercury poisoning can cause hallucinations and other symptoms of psychosis. Oh, ah, uh, ah, uh, looks like I've got another call coming in here. You give us a call in about four months or so when you start to run out, okie doke? And don't forget to... Keep it real. Boswell, Jackson, and Rose, how may I direct your call? This is Nancy Drew. Calling for Franklin Rose, please. Just a minute, please. Nancy, hello. Do you have any news? Not really, but something tells me this case is going to get complicated. Oh, Nancy, you zero in on a case like a heat-seeking missile, don't you? I feel so much better knowing you're going to follow up on every lead. I'll help in any way I can. Thanks, Mr. Rose. That's what I'm here for.
This is Nurse Bluefoot. Nurse Bluefoot, this is Nancy Drew. You left me a message regarding Henrik Vanderhune. How is he? Nancy Drew? Oh, thank goodness. Oh, I'm so relieved. We've been unable to locate any family members, and we do like amnesia patients to have at least one personal support person when they begin reality orientation. What's reality orientation? Well, reality orientation is a kind of treatment that helps a patient get reacquainted with the facts and circumstances of his or her life. Henrik has not actually lost his memory. It's just that his brain is injured in such a way that he can't access the place where the memories are stored. I see. So we need to help him find the trail of crumbs. Is that it? Exactly. First, we do repetitive memory exercises to help Henrik relearn the basic facts, like his name and address, the name of his parakeet, if he has one, the date, and so on. Second, we try to stimulate Henrik's sensory memories in order to help trigger or find the way back to his cognitive memories. What are sensory memories? A sensory memory is like it sounds, something that is familiar, that you recognize by sight or touch, smell or sound or... Oh, what is that last one? Oh, yes, taste. A cognitive memory is something that you know or remember intellectually. For example, how do you know the name of this planet? Somewhere along the way, you learn that it's called Earth, and you just remember. But say you bump your head and forget the name of this planet. You don't know where in the solar system you're floating. Yikes! Exactly. But then I show you a picture of our marvelous blue and green globe. Suddenly you remember. That glorious sight is Earth. I live on the planet Earth. This is how a sensory memory can trigger a cognitive or intellectual one. I still don't understand where I come in. You can't help Henrik remember his childhood, but you can probably help him remember his work, and who knows where that will take him. <laughs> All roads lead to Rome, as they say. One great tool is the Reality Orientation Board. This is a place to post information and pictures for the patient to look at over a period of time. You may want to bring in images or photos to place on the board. Things from the museum, perhaps. I see. Well, I'll be happy to help in any way I can. When are visiting hours? Visiting hours are 10 to 4 every day. If the patient is not engaged in treatment and if he seems stable. Great. Uh, is there anything else? Just remember, Henrik's brain has been knocked around like a peanut in its shell. He may have attention difficulties, headaches, uh, anxiety. Sometimes he may seem giddy, too. We need to keep these conditions in check. Don't push him too hard, or he may have some kind of meltdown. Thanks for the warning, Nurse Bluefoot. Be well. Need something? I've got work to do. Carpe diem. should I post here? You look familiar. Is it time for my snack? Henrik, it's me, Nancy. You're looking very well. 
I'm here to help with your memory exercises so you can come back to Beach Hill as soon as possible. Beach Hill? Beach Hill is a museum here in Washington, D.C. The curator's name is Joanna Riggs. You were working there, and that's where your accident happened. Do you remember anything about the accident? Joanna Riggs, is that the woman who called to pick my brain for an access code? Joanna called? What did you tell her? Where in my poor banged up head would I be keeping access codes? I don't even remember my own birthday. So if you're here to squeeze me for details, you're wasting your time. Actually, Nurse Bluefoot thinks with regular visits, I may be able to help you get your memory back more quickly. How, pray tell, do you intend to do that? I'll visit, we'll talk, sometimes I'll bring you pictures. Pictures? Well, isn't this nice? Think of it this way. You just got back from a fabulous trip. Only you can't remember the places you went. So you decide to look through postcards to see which ones you recognize. Fine, I'll do it. Great. These are Maya glyphs, like the ones you used to translate. Now, don't be upset if you don't know how to read them anymore. I can tell you what they mean. I know what they mean, dear. I wrote them. I'm sure you have written them at one time or another in your career. So what do you think this is all about? The magician suffers yellow death. Your translator is sloppy. I should know. I am the author of the original work. You don't agree with the translation? That first glyph is the fool, not the magician. Furthermore, any decent epigrapher knows those glyphs refer to the infamous plague of oozing hives. A fitting curse for a fool, don't you think? I rather like it. Henrik, this note was found at a crime scene. Are you telling me you left it there? I don't remember. I'm investigating the theft of the Pakal carving. Please, Henrik, try to remember something. Who in the world is Pakal? Oh, my head. Oh, the pressure. I can't take any more today, Nancy. Okay, it's time for some memory therapy. Nancy, could you come back tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs>